Imagine, after several weeks of being overfed with nauseating, repulsive food, you are, one fine night, cornered, grabbed by your feet, roughly stuffed into a crate and loaded onto a transport truck with forklifts. And in that terrifying process, you suffer from a broken leg, several lacerations, hemorrhage, dehydration, heat stroke, hypothermia, a heart failure, almost all happening at the same time. Jammed inside the crate, you find that there are hundreds like you, trapped, traveling in the same truck for up to 12 grueling hours, without food, without water, all subject to the extreme temperatures and weather conditions. And upon arrival, you and your fellow mates languish in these crates for an additional 12 hours before being unloaded. And finally, you are shackled and dragged upside down, fully conscious through electrified water that paralyzes your muscles before your neck is slashed. Apologies for such a gruesome start, but this is exactly what happens to a chicken. Or should I say this is what would have happened to almost 10,000 chickens since the beginning of my speech. Now imagine if a pig, a cow or a chicken would write a history book. I mean, that would be quite interesting. But in that book, we humans would be portrayed as genocidal zealots who thrive on suffering. Globally, over 200 million animals are killed every single day. That is 75 billion in a year. That means every one and a half years, we kill more animals than all humans that have lived in our 200,000 year human history. Born into a staunch vegetarian family, I've been averse to meat eating right from the start. Vegetarianism is rooted in my family culture, and well, it's based on the doctrine of Ahimsa. However, to be very honest, it was initially out of respect for my parents that I remained a vegetarian. But after several years of research and inquiry, I've started to understand that while vegetarianism is definitely a personal lifestyle choice, I believe it is my duty to highlight the ethical, economic, and environmental dimensions to this particular choice making so that others can make conscious lifestyle choices focused more on the style and focus more on the life and less on the style, focus more on the larger good and less on individual pleasure. I mean, we all love meat, don't we? Uh, I mean, I don't, but meat was once a luxury product, but today it is a cheap and easily available source of fat and protein. But many of my friends can't even have a proper meal without meat involved in it. And it's this triviality that characterizes the meat culture that has not so trivial dimensions if we look at the larger picture of how it affects not just humanity, but all life and living on the planet. But to be fair, those who derive their pleasure from meat hardly ever see how the meat is made or how it lands up on their plates. So we can't say that just not eating meat doesn't necessarily make one a good person, and eating meat doesn't necessarily make one bad. Life is undoubtedly and unarguably complicated. So I thought, let's simplify it. So it is a widely ignored but baffling absurdity that we humans use the most inefficient, unsustainable, uneconomic ways of feeding ourselves. Our voracious appetite for the meaty diet is literally eating up the planet. 83% of the Earth's farmland is used as a feeding ground for livestock. Not only that, in the process of glamorizing and eventually standardizing meat culture, we have completely ignored the appalling nature of the output to input ratio in our chase for prioritizing food made in manufacturing plants over food made of plants. And for example, only 3% of all calories that are fed to cows actually gets converted into beef. 27% of global fresh water is consumed by the meat industry. Let's understand this. That means to produce one pound of beef, the water required is estimated to be 200 times that of one pound of plant foods. I mean, in a world where we know there are millions of people who don't have access to clean drinking fresh water, how can we ever justify the untrammeled wastage of water resources? And let's also not ignore how unsustainable the system has become. The meat industry causes over 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. That is more than all ships, planes, cars, and trucks combined. But even from a macroeconomic perspective, right? Even if we look at it from an economics perspective, 
There's this common idea that hundreds and thousands of people would lose their jobs because of this sudden shift in demand. That's actually quite far from the truth. In reality, what would happen is there would be the plant-based food industry gradually replacing the meat industry. Moreover, even the poorer sections of society, a big stakeholder would actually benefit. Estimates say that an additional 3.5 billion people can be nourished if we just start eating the food we fed to plants, we fed to animals. Well, for a second here, let's assume that meat is the most economic, functional, sustainable food on the planet. Why not? Well, can we still ignore the undeniable fact that it comes from actual living beings? Well, plants are living too, right? Of course, they are. However, let's understand this fundamental difference. Unlike plants, animals, when in threat of an attack, can withdraw, escape, protect, or even attack. They need to be brutally trounced, trapped, and eventually slaughtered. Meanwhile, on the other hand, plants don't even have a nervous system to be able to feel like how animals and humans do. Hence, when I take a fruit off a plant, I call it plucking, not severing or beheading. When I throw away a flower, it will pollinate. When you throw away a fruit, the seed will eventually sprout. So thus, there is really no comparison between the two. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic, which originated in a wet market in China, has once again highlighted this link between meat consumption, our insatiable demand for meat products, and the outbreak of diseases. The meat chain, right from the sourcing all the way up to the slaughtering, is just a flourishing breeding ground for all kinds of viruses, bacteria, and pathogens. Also in factory farms, in order to minimize sickness and promote unnatural growth, farmers feed these animals all kinds of antibiotics. And did you, did you know that animals actually consume more antibiotics on factory farms than all humans do? And what tends to happen is the bacteria develop a resistance against these antibiotics, resulting in the formation of what scientists call superbugs, new belligerent species of pathogens. So in short, by drugging these animals on factory farms in order to keep them somehow alive, millions of humans are falling sick and dying. This link between human meat consumption and the outbreak of diseases is not a new phenomenon or discovery. In ancient India, the cradle of vegetarianism, great scholars and thinkers recommended a healthy vegetarian diet, knowing fully well of the health consequences of meat consumption. Even in the West, great philosophers, Plato, Pythagoras, Plutarch, they all believed that humans are not physically, mentally, or biologically fit to be able to consume meat flesh like wild animals. As Paul McCartney, a famous vegan himself, once said, if slaughterhouses had glass walls, everyone would be a vegetarian. A popular counter to vegetarianism is this ingenious animal social contract theory, where we do them a favor by giving them a house, we breed them, we feed them, and, and in return for our favor, they give us their flesh and skin to eat. However, no animal ever signs up for that kind of a bargain. So coming back to my initial question, how do we align our personal pleasures to the larger good, to some degree? Now, obviously, I don't expect all of you to suddenly become vegetarians after my speech. Well, if you do, you can thank me later. But I believe each and every one of you in this audience can make a big difference to the meat culture in our society. Here are a few suggestions. Number one, buy only the amount of meat that you and your family plan to consume. In America, over 20% of the meat that's purchased ends up going wasted. Let's stop this needless killing for animals. Number two, look for animal welfare labeling on the packaging of the meat that you purchase. So try to purchase meat of animals that are relatively well treated. Number three, try to eliminate at least one meat product from a meal a day. Try to have meat-free days, maybe even meat-free weeks, and eventually meat-free months. Number four, donate to animal welfare charities. Invest in upcoming synthetic and plant-based meat research projects. And finally, explore animal-free dietary options. Make your meals more and more vegetarian. While it is nature's law that one animal shall live upon another animal's flesh, it may seem perfectly justified for us to eat animals. However, ancient wisdom 
tells us something else. Ancient wisdom tells us that such a law only governs the lower animal nature. There are moral and spiritual laws that do not express themselves in lower animals, but in human beings alone. Man stands at the head of the animal kingdom, not because he possesses in a superior form those very attributes that exist in lower animals, but because he's capable of subduing the animal nature and rising above it. Survival of the fittest, his nature's law, no doubt. But sacrifice by the fittest for the survival of all is the supreme law. Thank you.